Okay, there we go. All right, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, we start in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask him to send peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well as ask him that we remain a part of his ummah until the day of judgment. Um, Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Yasser Mirza, the moderator of her second session uh, of Spiritual Essentials presented by YM Dallas where we talk about imperative concepts that build the believer. I uh, have with me the man who needs no introduction, uh, the one and only Sheikh Yasser Bajas. Uh, just a quick inter introduction real quick about Sheikh Yasser. Uh, he's the head of Islamic law and theory department at Al-Maghrib Institute. He's also the resident imam at Valley Ranch Islamic Center. Today's topic, inshallah, is going to be about gender relations and how to maintain the halal aspect in a relationship. Uh, please note that any questions you have, uh, you may submit them in the Google form, which, is, which should be in the Zoom chat any second now, um, and as well as a YouTube live stream. We will try to get through as many questions as we can the last 15 minutes at the end of our session. Uh, with that, I'll let you take over, Sheikh Yasser Bajas. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh. Nabiyyuna Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. The statement kathiratun man ma ba'd. My dear brothers and sisters, inshallah ta'ala, and those who are watching with us and listening to us, when it comes to the subject of uh, the gender relations uh, from the Muslim point of view and perspectives, especially living in the 21st century, in the, uh, 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 the Me Too movement era as well, and all what it's surrounding it, it's becoming more of very challenging, uh, really. Uh, every day we see new things coming out in, in, in the society, a new development, and a new movement also. Of course, people, the younger generation nowadays, they're kind of crossing the boundaries and pushing the limits. And so there are a lot of actually conversation, even within the Muslim community, what does it mean exactly? I mean, I remember the days, I remember the days when uh, uh, we used to go to, to Islamic conferences and we give a lecture, for example, that was about 20 years ago or so. So people will come to you and they ask you questions about what is the meaning of this ayah? And what's the meaning? How do we understand this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Then a few years later, obviously, with the invention of, of, of the technology and social media and people now having a lot of uh, uh, cross-gender interaction to a certain limit uh, through MySpace, through forums, through emails and all the stuff and so on, then people start asking more questions, more of like, not what does it mean, basically, instead now saying, um, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say so-and-so? Why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say so-and-so? Right now. Then fast forward to our time today, people that are asking even, why do you even have to acknowledge the Quran or the Sunnah to begin with? We're living in the 21st century. So I want to make this premise very clearly because a lot of uh, our values when it comes to understand that uh, the gender relationship is no longer as they used to be as conservative as it used to be in the past, or as, as they should be, to be honest with you, from Muslim uh, point of view and traditional point of view. Uh, in, the, in the time of, uh, in the culture of our time, uh, when it comes to the, the, the source of, uh, uh, of values, the source of uh, principles, it's become very, very diverse. And people, they no longer necessarily uh, follow traditional uh, values. So therefore, they are now left to start making their own. And as a result, we start seeing a lot of the brothers and sisters within the Muslim community exploring other cultures, other traditions, other principles, um, other ideologies, even from that perspective. And obviously what they learn when it comes to um, learning what they know from the traditional value, they find it kind of like challenging. Which one should I hold on to? Which one should I forfeit? And so on. So it becomes a big challenge for a lot of our younger brothers and sisters to understand this, uh, uh, this dynamic. So I just want to make this introduction very clearly for people to know what we're going to be talking about, where this is coming from. That's the first thing. The second point I want to mention here, from a Muslim, obviously, when it comes to the establishment of principles and values, it is embedded in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And for a believer, for a Muslim, of course, uh, this life is all a test from Allah Azza wa Jal. He created us to worship him, to obey the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to uh, uh, come bring ourselves as close as possible to Allah Azza wa Jal, of course, following the example on the Quran and the Sunnah. Even at the time of his death Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made it very, very clear. He said, fikum I'm leaving behind two things for you. As long as you hold on to them, you're never going to go astray. Kitab Allah wa Sunnah. The book of Allah 
and my sunnah, my tradition. So the resources for us are very clear. Whatever in the Quran, we take it. Whatever is not there, we remove it. Whatever in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, we accept that. Whatever is, whatever is not there, we also, we, we, we reject that. And as Muslim, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something, uh, our position should be سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا وَفَرَكَ رَبَّنَا If Allah Azza wa Jal command us to do something, our position would be what? We listen and we obey. And the Prophet Sallallahu as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, وَأَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولِ You obey Allah and obey the Messenger. So therefore, you know, it's also whatever the Prophet Sallallahu mentions, we follow. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Whatever comes to you from the Prophet, you accept that or take it, whatever uh, the Prophet Sallallahu forbade you from, then you should abstain from it. So with these principles right now, Let's go and see what does the Quran tell us about our relationship with uh, the opposite gender. So we talk about gender relationship, like I said. So there are two things. The first thing is our, our culture today, the context in which we're living right now. And uh, number two, the values and the principles, the foundations from where our interaction within this context should spring out and should, be, should look like uh, for Muslims again. Um, so now that we understand, we have values that we need to hold on to that is spring from the sacred text of the Quran and the Son of the Prophet Sallallahu But also we are, we are we're, we're now being challenged with the dynamic of our time. So how can I reconcile my values with my time and so on? So I'm gonna mention the traditional point of view, obviously. And once we're done with that, we're gonna open to a dialogue, inshallah ta'ala, <clears throat> and to your questions and start kind of like a dialogue on the subject from your point of view, from what you know from the from the brothers and the sisters, what they talk about, what can we tackle in regards to these issues? So here's the thing. Uh, the very, very, um, I would say, core of the problem here or the issue is the question that many people, they ask, is it permissible? Is it okay for boys and girls, men and women to be friends? Because the whole concept of, you know, gender relationship over here is, uh, do we even have to have any specific guidelines or boundaries when it comes to interacting with each other. Are we bound by a certain tradition, code of, uh, of conduct or ethics and so on? The answer is yes. As Muslim, we do believe that there are specific guidelines that we need to follow and we need to accept and, and, uh, and go by. Again, we go by the guidelines of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the very question that many people ask today that if it's possible to have, you know, guy friends or girlfriends, not to the extent where we say, you know, stuff for Allah, we don't commit zina, we don't, you know, uh, you know, date like, you know, conventional dating and so on. So no, we're just, we're just being friends. So here's the thing. When it comes to dealing with someone from the opposite gender, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made very clear in the Quran, in Surah Al-Nisa, he says, to women, he says, muhsanatin ghayra musafihatin wala mutakhidati akhdan. That women need to keep their chastity, ghayra musafihat means they don't go astray, wala mutakhidati akhdan, and they don't take akhdan. Akhdan means bosom friends from the opposite gender. And to men, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said the exact same thing in Surah Al-Ma'idah, where he says, muhsinina, ghayra musafihina, wala muttakhidi akhdan. For men, the same thing too. They need to stay chast, they need to keep their chastity, protect their chastity, ghayra musafihin, which means they don't actually commit any adultery, fornication, and so on, wala muttakhidi akhdan, and they don't take also bosom friends from the opposite gender. Okay. So what about our interaction with, to what limit should our interaction with the opposite would be? So as uh, for a man, for example, and in this case, your relationship with women will be one of three relationships. Number one, whether she, she's a mahram to you, mahram, which means unmarriageable kin. And the unmarriageable kin and the unmarriageable kin would be your, uh, uh, in this case, your parents, mom and dad, obviously. So for the men, it's your mom, for the women, it's your dad. And then you have your siblings, your siblings, and also you have uh, your uncles and your aunts, and you have obviously your children, grandchildren all the way down. So you have your parents and grandparents all the way up, parents, children, grandchildren all the way down. And then you have, of course, you know, the collaterals, in this case, your brothers and your sisters, your uncles and your aunts. We say your uncles and your aunts, we're talking about the direct uncle and aunt, your paternal and maternal uncle and aunt. And also, of course, you know, in this case, will be your great grand uncle, and which is the uncle of your parents and so forth. These are also considered mahram to you. So these people, 
how do you interact with them? There is no need for a hijab to be observed in front of them. There is no need uh, to uh, have restriction in terms of you know, shaking hands, you know, hugging or, or kissing and so on. So of course, with the overall general guidelines of modesty and respect for one another, uh, for age factor and all the stuff and so on. Uh, that's the first category, obviously. The second category, then you have uh, uh, you're your spouse. In this case, for the man, your wife, for the woman, your husband. Uh, obviously, in, in this relationship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed for people to be in the most vulnerable to another, in the most intimate with one another. So whatever is considered haram to be committed outside of the marital relationship, it was made halal in this regard with the guidelines of the marriage, of course. Then we have the third category. These are the men and women with whom you have no mahram relationship. They're not part of your non-marriageable kin, and they're not your spouse. So these are now the vast majority of the population, obviously. And are we even allowed to have interaction with them? The answer, of course, absolutely. I mean, it's ridiculous even you know, to think that you cannot, you can never have a, a decent relationship with someone from the opposite gender. We understand that because you have them all over. You deal with people all over. You have your neighbors, you have your cousins, you have your, uh, uh, your classmates these days. If you have coworkers, if you go shopping, for example, the, the, uh, the cashier, for instance, so all these, obviously, all these people right now, uh, they're not related to you in that sense. They're related to you in being you know, part of your community, but not to the extent that it's considered mahram to you. So how do I interact with these people? And this is where the general guidelines, the etiquette of the, dealing with the opposite gender should be observed over here. Likewise. So alhamdulillah, in, in, in Islam, we have, we have general, again, rules for interacting with one another. So when you go out in public, both men and women are requested to, first of all, look modest in a certain way. For the women, it's the hijab. For the men to dress up in a certain way. Also, when, go, when you go out and you interact with other people, make sure that you deal with them in, a, in an equal mental level. You deal with them on a professional level, obviously. Uh, and in this case, when you speak to them, you speak to them in, in, in kindness and gentleness, but not necessarily with uh, being too lenient to the extent that, you know, you, uh, you compromise your, uh, your space in that regard. Uh, also, that is opposite for both men and women. Uh, we are required to observe ghaddul basar, which means not to look you know, at something you're not supposed to look at, especially when you know that people nowadays, as they walk in the summer, you know, their code of modesty is way different from what Muslims they observe. So therefore, we are required to take extra precautions as we look at one another. And if you talk, it's okay to talk to someone, you know, to whatever you're asking for, what you're getting from them and so on and have a conversation. But remember to keep things in a professional setting as Allah subhanahu says in the Quran. Um, um, uh, uh, which means don't be too lenient in the way in, in your form of speech. Otherwise, the stuff for Allah, the one whose heart is, is sick and diseased, uh, uh, will basically, uh, in this case, will cause harm, which means a sign of protection. And that applies also for men too. Meaning we need to keep our social boundaries for both men and women to stay safe and protected, inshallah ta'ala. Remember that all of this is uh, in order to, to keep, alhamdulillah, I mean, the safety of our life, the safety of our chastity, and also, subhanAllah, the sanctity of the society altogether. So some of the, uh, the rules also between men and women, obviously, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it very clear that having, um, uh, you know, premarital uh, relations is considered actually forbidden uh, altogether. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned very clearly in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَحِشَّةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا As Allah said in Surah Al-Isra. So do not, uh, do not come close to a zina, fornication. Because it's, it's considered fahisha, which means it's, it's, it's considered a, a major sin. Wasa'a sabila, and, and, and wicked that path that people take for themselves. And in Hadith Abi Huray, radiallahu ta'ala, anhu arda, the Prophet sallallahu expands on that concept of a zina. He says, Kullu ibn Adam akhidun haddahu min zina la mahala. Every son of Adam is going to end up falling into some form of zina, fornication, one way or another. La mahala. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, So the eye commits fornication, and that is by looking at something haram. Well, Udur Tazni, and the ear also commits form of zina, and that is in the form, of course, of listening to something that is inappropriate. 
And then the hand also as well to commit that zina in the action that it does and, and so on. And then the Prophet says, The nafs means yourself starts kind of have a whims of desires and kind of like get provoked and get excited and get tempted and, uh, and so on. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the private part, you know, would prove that or otherwise. Like, does that, does that desire goes into effect or otherwise based on the circumstances? So here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, uh, is, 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 is actually expanding that concept of zina. And frankly and unfortunately, we live in a time where this form of zina has become extremely, extremely easy. Nowadays, even if, if you have a phone, and obviously most people have phones, you know, and you have social media accounts, whether you like it or not, somehow this is gonna pop on your screen. Like even if you don't solicit that stuff, it will find its way to your screen at some point. And some people, unfortunately, they just allow themselves to look at it and they get desynthesized. And as a result, we start looking at men and women who are not supposed, you're not supposed to be looking at them in these kind of, you know, clothings or these kind of settings or whatever that is, until unfortunately, uh, the sense of haya, the sense of, of modesty, the sense of shyness is now start eroding and start kind of disappearing slowly and gradually, which is why in our time, that sense of when you speak about modesty, when you speak about, you know, the boundaries of haya and shyness between men and women as, a, as an act of chivalry, uh, people just kind of, it's too foreign for them these days. Why? Because since people got used to the interaction on social media, all these boundaries were disappearing and kind of like dying out. And then eventually people find it easy for them to get involved into this kind of interaction. Um, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, is our creator. He appeared in a way and he knows what is best for us. And he said subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, it says, Ala ya'lu man khalaq, wa huwa al khabir. Doesn't he know well, and he's the one who's created? Like he knows it's because he created us. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he set, sent down for us certain guidelines, these are the best guidelines for us. Maybe to certain individuals, in certain contexts, certain, you know, situations, it might not sound, again, it might not sound as, great as it should be or as exciting as it should be for, for people but uh, if you truly believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believe that Allah azza wa jal is the almighty and he knows best what is best for you you will definitely just listen and obey and put that your trust in Allah azza wa jal's judgment uh, finally the last thing I want to mention is in regards to our dear brothers and sisters and for example the YM young Muslims and MSAs and so forth I know that again, in the context of our culture, a lot of people, they want to push the boundaries and go beyond what is considered permissible. And many of the brothers and sisters who choose to stay in the modest side, or uh, you know, they're, they're kind of ostracized, as if they're considered you know, different, they're considered you know, um, this and that. But you know what? I just want you to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designed us naturally to be inclined to one another men, women, to be inclined towards one another, that's a, that's a natural thing. And, and, and the shaitan is, is clearly is taking advantage of that and getting in between us. The Prophet says in the hadith, that no man and woman are alone except the shaitan is with them. So therefore, these things we need to understand that we need to keep our, our guards up as we interact with another in these settings. We need to make sure that we, we respect one another, respect the space of one another. We deal with our brothers and sisters in the most professional way, in an equal mental level, and of course, in the most modest way, inshallah wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve you all, ya Rabbil Alameen, and protect you all, and keep you safe in the dunya and in the akhirah. There is so much we can talk about more, inshallah, in regards to the concept of interaction between men and women. And, and gender relations, but I want to leave actually uh, more time for people to ask their questions because I would love to answer their needs than just giving them uh, in lecture information. So I would like to see, inshallah, if you guys have anything we can talk about, inshallah, discuss with the lab. All right, if anyone uh, has any questions, uh, go ahead and either drop them in the Zoom chat. Uh, or if you've asked a question, the Google form will address that in a second. We'll go priority to people in here. Amazing. 
Do you allow people to ask uh, uh, live or do they need to drop the question? Yeah, if you if you do have any questions, uh, you could like I said, you could either drop them in the chat, um, or so we have a question here. Uh, so this person asks, what's considered uh, khawla? Khalwa. Khalwa. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So what is what is considered khalwa? Um, now the concept of khalwa in the Arabic language, khalwa basically means you know to be in in seclusion or to be basically in private in privacy. So al-khalwa obviously is different than ikhtilaf. So people need to separate between two things. Khalwa is in complete privacy. Ikhtilaf is mixing, intermingling. So going, for example, to the park, being in school, being in the classroom, this is called ikhtilaf, which means intermingling because men and women are all there in public, right? But khalwa is when you go, for example, to uh, uh, when you go drive in the car, for example, together. No one else is with you. When they go in their own apartment, there no one is with them. Or even actually, if they go to a cafe, for example, but they take a corner where no one else is watching them. So in this case, this is all considered khalwa. And the khalwa is definitely between men and women who are not related by blood or again by marriage. It is not acceptable. As a matter of fact, it's dangerous. Uh, if people need that, for example, for business, let's say you have a, a business meeting, you're going to have to meet a representative of a certain company or even this school or that project, that you have to be with someone from the opposite gender. I always recommend for my dear brothers and sisters, inshallah, that to make it in somewhere where they have ikhtilad and khalwa, which means cafe, restaurant, public place, the library, whatever that is, uh, and, and do it basically and, and make sure that inshallah ta'ala, you keep yourself safe with Allah Azza wa All right, so we have another question. Um, a lot of the, I just wanted to mention this, a lot of the times today, uh, especially kids our age, we're so desensitized to uh, interactions with the opposite gender that we don't really know where the line is. Uh, so the question this person asked is, how do we interact with classmates or coworkers? Uh, where is the balance between being too friendly and just, you know, being, being that one weird guy? Because especially today, it's, <laughs> if, if you, even if you try to obey what's, what's right, then people, people look at you like you're, like you're weird. So how do you, how do you mm -hmm. kind of balance that? You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless your heart, Jama'ah, and may Allah make it easy for you. Here's the thing. You were created to stand out, not to blend in, really. You have to understand that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet Sassam says about our deen, Bada al-Islam gharibu, wa sa'udu gharibun kama bada fatub al ghuraba You know, which means Islam started with stranger, and will return one day to become a stranger again. Fatub al ghuraba Give the good news for those strangers. We're going to live like strangers in time like this, subhanAllah. I mean, this is a time where really Muslims are living in the biggest estrangement, which means in your own society, you know, you, you consider the minority. And now if you're going to become that conservative person within the Muslim community, you're even more actually a stranger right now. So for those brothers and sisters who would like to hold on to the values of the Quran, and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallam, I salute you, really, for holding on to this. This is not an easy thing to do. It's definitely very, very important. But then, what is it that is considered the practice of the Prophet Sallallahu the son of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, versus culture? So that these are the boundaries we need to we need to actually to draw over here. So again, Islamically, if you're going to be speaking with someone from the opposite gender, if there is a need for that, like what we're working on a project, for example, or we I want to buy from someone, let's say in the store, or uh, it's your, for example, your doctor or the nurse or something like that. What do I do in this case? Do I look on the ground and not talk to them and just, you know, kind of uh, uh, go away? You're going to have to talk to them. So you talk to them and keep in your mind, you talk to them again on an equal mental level with full respect and, and with, with modesty. If the circumstances were kind of getting you feeling uncomfortable, like they're getting too close, for example, or uh, the situation is completely uncomfortable, being, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a place... Uh, there is nobody else, for example, or even a lady is not maybe dressed up, or the guy is not, for example, you know, kind of approaching you modestly. In this case, you need to make sure that you move to a different space where it's close, what's easier for you to interact, inshallah ta'ala, without having to be worried about being alone with this individual. So the idea is you deal with them on a, on a, in a professional way and on an equal mental level. It's not your job or your duty to have a, a social interaction with them on a regular basis. Like, for example, hey, let's have uh, uh, ice cream or let's go uh, uh, and have a, 
a cup of coffee. And then, and then you have the brother, the boys and the girls sitting together like siblings, mashallah, and no boundaries whatsoever. With all due respect, that is, that is Islamically unacceptable. I know it's becoming the new scene for the Muslim youth elsewhere around the, around the country. But you guys are going to have to understand, you are uh, jeopardizing really, not just you know, the, 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 the principle of faith, but also uh, your own personal understanding of things and life. And, and subhanAllah, you have no idea uh, how much, how much this, these memories could, could actually stay with people. And if they have done anything wrong, la qadar Allah can haunt them in the future. So I just want them to be safe, inshallah. But again, you make sure to keep your relationship very professional and uh, speaking to the point. Uh, when it starts going into extreme, you know, kind of like socializing, this is when you realize, okay, we're getting too comfortable right now. And when it becomes too personal, even, that becomes even more dangerous. Um, and I know a lot of people might say, what about getting to know somebody for marriage? You know, I want to do this. I want to have this conversation for the purpose of marriage. Well, be careful what you wish for. Because statistically speaking, I can tell you, the closer you get to know somebody on campus when you're not re ready for marriage, the less likely you're married them. Because they get too close and they, get, they, they, they know so much about you or you know so much about them that you no longer feel them interesting for marriage. So people are willing to think about getting married to someone across the country by marrying someone from the same campus on, on the same school now. Mashallah, that was a very good answer. Uh, another question that we had was, uh, how can we avoid inappropriate gender relations concerning private messaging, um, especially today where we have Instagram, Snapchat, uh, we have all these new and upcoming social media apps. How do you, what's your, what, what would your response be to that? Your responsibility is to Allah, not to me. Not to you, not to anybody else. If people can really observe that principle, nothing matters after that. You see, when, when Hassan asked the Prophet, or the Prophet, actually Hassan, he reported the Prophet وسلم, saying, This is the best, the best advice I can give people in regards to these situations. Because I remember one of our mashayikh was asked, Sheikh Shankiti Ta'ala was asked, Can you give us one uh, more of like a, a, a schedule, a roadmap, you know, for our lives? He goes, Okay, go ahead, get ready, bring your papers, blah, blah, blah. So people, they thought they're going to give a long, long list of, of instructions. He said this hadith. The Prophet says, Be conscious of Allah Azza wa wherever you are. The second thing, if you make a mistake, follow that with good deeds, we'll erase it for you. Number three, treat people with good manners. What does that exactly mean? You need to make sure that your life is in conscience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like I need to make sure that I keep, you know, conscious of Allah Azza wa Jal throughout my life. Whatever I am, whether we most likely going to make mistakes. We're most likely going to number two because we're human beings. We're most likely going to make mistakes. So what do we do? That's not the end of the world. The Prophet says, I'm standing, if you make a mistake, recalibrate. Just do something good, erase it. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, erase it. Do something good, erase that for you. So don't live in the guilt. Remember that your mistakes are not a life sentence for you. They're just a lesson that you learn from, you grow through it in addition to going through it. Uh, so therefore, you try your best to stay conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. Fear Allah azza wa and be always on, my, on your mind. Number two, if I make a mistake because I slip and make a mistake, I need to recalibrate and go back again to get up. Number three, if I'm going to mess it up, that's what it means. If I'm going to mess it up, the Prophet says, don't make your mistakes by hurting other people. Like if you make your mistake, make it against your own self. Okay? Make something personal that, you know, a mistake. But if that mistake involves hurting somebody else, then the liability is going to be much, much greater than you can imagine. Because again, you might be by yourself alone, you commit a sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, Rabbi Alameen. But then if that, if that sin involves hurting somebody else, then our liability is going to be great. So again, what do I do in order to stop doing that? I want you to keep thinking about this hadith. Number one, you be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever you are. Whether you're in a private chat, 
on a direct messaging, you know, uh, uh, on Instagram, whatever, or you're sending someone uh, uh, a private video uh, uh, chat, whatever that is, remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching all of this. And then the second thing, I'm a, we- I'm a human being. I'm, I'm going to get weak. I'm, I'm going to make a mistake. It's okay. That's not the end of the world. We calibrate, pick it up from there, and move forward. And make something better, inshallah ta'ala. We erase it for you. And the third thing, if I'm going to mess it up, don't hurt other people. خالق الناس بخلق الحسن. Treat people in good manners, inshallah ta'ala. Hopefully, their dua for you. You're going to suffice to enter the Jannah in Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah Okay, just two more questions, inshallah, before we conclude. Uh, one of the questions is actually pretty good. So, especially today, uh, like we're talking about, we don't really know where the line is between, even if we are trying to get to marry someone, inshallah, one day. Uh, but mm-hmm. we don't really know where the line is before we cross being too, um, be when you want to stay in, you know, halal, but also you don't want to cross that line. So the question is, what is the ideal way of scoping out a potential spouse and communicating without going too far? If you're in high school, forget it. <laughs> okay if you're in high school forget it don't tell me no 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 inshallah we're going to need to talk to the families and we're going to get engagement and inshallah five years down the road we're going to get married as sweet as beautiful as it sounds I wish it was realistic it could happen to some people I understand that and I've seen it happen for a few people but, but in terms of ratio and number it's very very slim chance the other thing uh, even if you're in college even if you're in college, I know a lot of people, the moment they hit college, the first thing they focus on is the social aspect of college more than anything else. So therefore, they want to start a relationship. They want to secure themselves in a relationship. But even that is not realistic. So the re- reality, uh, and I, I did for, uh, a few workshops you know, for youth and college students in regards to the subject of marriage. And we asked them simple questions. We did surveys and we collected data from them. So when we ask the ladies, uh, what is it that is, what's the main reason for them to delay their marriages? The number one reason for them to delay their marriages was actually um, uh, their parents. And the number one reason for their parents to delay their marriage is their education. And the number one reason for that is just in case. So as a safety net, obviously, they want to finish education first so they can have something, you know, la qadrullah. That connotation and that conditioning is bad. Because we're already actually telling our daughters, you know, uh, marriage is horrible. You're going to end up in divorce. You have to have a job. You have to have this and that and so on. So the conditioning is extremely bad. There's no you need to be educated, but for the good reason, not for the bad reason. Now, when it comes to the guys, when we ask them, what is the reason for them that they their marriages? It's the same reason as well. But they say, number one reason for them is actually because they want to finish their education first. Okay, but why? because they want to have a career and provide. So basically, financially speaking, their biggest issue, they're not yet financially stable. What do we learn from this? Simple fact. As long as the guy is still in college, doesn't have a a stable uh, job or a stable income, he is not mentally, he believes in his own mind, he is not ready for marriage. And as long as the lady also in college and still, you know, in, in school, she's most likely to believe is not ready yet for marriage. So for young men and women to start looking while they're still in school or for freshman, uh, you know, year in college and so on, it's torture. They're going to get themselves entangled in a lot of emotional, uh, you know, drama. And, and Allah knows how it's going to end up. You have no idea the kind of stories I deal with because of that stuff. It's not, I'm talking about reality here. And I'm talking about just, you know, kind of like uh, someone told me this. No, I, I deal with these cases from young men and women. So there is a lot of drama happens as a result of that. So it's better for you knowing that, you know what? I'm not getting, getting married anytime soon. So let me just put this on the side and focus on my education. Finish your school or better off, if you think that you can, while you are actually take, uh, taking classes, you can find a job, inshallah, azawajal, go for it. When you become ready, or at least close to being ready for marriage, let's say you're in the last year of, of college, for example, that's when you start maybe, maybe I would say, start looking into looking for potentials or prospects. 
And this is when you start opening up for, you know, if there's anybody that you know and so forth. Obviously, also we need to be realistic about this issue. Most men and women, when they, when they get married, they want to look for someone with an age gap. Like the ladies, they would like to have a guy who's maybe one or two or three years older. And the guys, the same thing when it comes to marrying a girl. This is something I don't, I didn't, I don't put these rules. When we ask people and survey, that's what they give us. So as a result, if you're already in the, in the uh, senior year of college as a guy, you're most likely thinking of somebody who is maybe second year, junior year, or even actually even freshman year. And that means she's still going to be in college for the next two, three years. And for the lady, if she's in senior year, obviously, uh, the same thing. She might be looking for someone who's actually outside of college, who's already establishing himself. So if she's going to marry someone who's still working on establishing himself while he's a senior over there, um, it becomes very challenging. So the point is to be, to be practical and pragmatic. I'm giving you pr practical answers right now. Is that if you want to start looking, you only do that when you're about to start, inshallah, the process of getting married. Don't start three, ahead, three, four years ahead because, inshallah, when I'm done, bidnillah, I will marry her, I will marry him. Like you start in a, an emotional relationship for three, four years, it, it's going to be torture. May Allah make it easy for you guys. Yeah, so, to recap, uh, so there was a question here that said, when do you know uh, when you're ready for marriage? But I think you did answer when you know when you're emotionally mature. Correct? You know, I, 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 uh, it's a very interesting question. Because people, they ask me, when do I know that I'm ready for marriage? I said, when you say so. So what does that exactly mean? I said, you see, if you're going to always wait to feel that you're ready for marriage, you're going to keep pushing the boundaries further and further and further. Because trust me, you will never feel ready enough to get married. So what does that mean? It's a mental decision. You need to decide that I'm ready for that. However, that mental decision has variables to make it reasonable. Like what? What is the expectation for people to be ready for marriage? Finish school, for example, or at least have a job that, alhamdulillah, brings stable income. That is enough to start a family and open a house and take care of bills and this and that and so on. So having, alhamdulillah, support from the surrounding and the family, if, if there is any, like there are certain circumstances need to be taken into consideration. Because I know a lot of people, they think of Hadith and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya ma'ashar al-shabab, all young people. Uh, if you can get married, bismillah, go for it. And they say, here is it. The Prophet said, you know what, just go ahead and do it. And the Prophet only said, you know, it's akhlaq and deen. If you have the two qualities, he didn't ask about money, he didn't ask about anything. Yeah, but back then, the dynamic of life was different. The financial demand was very, very, very different than our time. Today, to start a family, you're going to have to have at least a certain income that cover all the expenses. So once again, when we say, when do you say that I'm ready? This is basically when you decide. So I, used, I usually tell people, you need to put a date. Like knowing your circumstances today, in, this, in, in 2020, for example, we're in July 2020. I know based on my two more years of college, and then uh, probably I might uh, go to master's for two more years or four years. So in this case, I will say, for example, in 2025, July 2025, I need to be married. And then start working backward from there. Make all the plans to get you there. Wallahu alam. Okay, so one last question before we end it off, inshallah. Uh, someone asked a very interesting question. Uh, they asked, if someone were to suffer an emotional toll from a haram, from a haram relationship, uh, maybe even uh, committing zina, God forbid, how should they recover and bounce back? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them, Ya Rabbil Alameen and make the recovery easy and blissful and successful. SubhanAllah, I, as, as, as damaging as this might sound to go through such a, a traumatic experience, really, uh, our ulama, they always want us to focus on the positives. So to show how is that, how is that working, when the man came to the Prophet Wasallam, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I committed adultery. I want you to purify me. Like, punish me. Like, I can't live with this guilt. Punish me. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? He turned his face away from him. He just like, I didn't hear it. Just go, go, go. Just go. I, just, I didn't hear that. But the man, the fire in his heart is killing him. So he goes to the Prophet ﷺ on the other side. Facing the Prophet ﷺ, said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm telling you, I did it. 
I did it. Please purify me, punish me. And the Prophet looks on the other side. It's like, I didn't hear it, just go, just go. Uh, the meaning of go, just go and repent. That's what it means. And the man, he just couldn't. He just went to the Prophet on the other side. Ya Rasulullah, I'm telling you, I did it. Please purify me. I need you to punish me. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ, not even trying to look into, into his face, he looks at the people around him. He goes, do you know him? They said, yes, sir. So we know this man. He said, is he okay? Is he okay up here? He said, I mean, we don't know any wrong, anything wrong with him. Like the Prophet ﷺ was trying to find an excuse for him to let him go. So the idea uh, is that our mistakes, once again, our feeling of guilt, shouldn't be a life sentence that we are entrapped into this time capsule and we never move forward. We need to learn that this was just a lesson that will teach us something valuable in our life that we never ever go back again, that we never tread the same route that led us to these mistakes. Ibn Qayyim al Jazi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he comments on the story of the lady who committed a sin that sin, she stole gold and jewelry from the other women, and she was punished for that. Uh, the story goes on before that she was punished is that her family, who they're from the elitist of the Banu Mahzum society in, in Mecca, they felt embarrassed by the fact that she's going to be publicly punished. And so they tried to ransom her and tried to kind of like bail her out of it. And the Prophet was very upset. Eventually she was punished. Then Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, she said about that lady, Qalatum mahasuna islamwa. She became a very righteous woman after that. So from this Ibn Qayyim, he concludes, he goes, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put people in certain trials, even if it was committing a sin like this. He puts them in certain trials that these sins could become a blessing in disguise. Why? Because if it wasn't for that sin, they would have never repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they would never return back to Allah azza wa jal with full consciousness and full acceptance. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive, forgive this person, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for them to recover and to move forward. So keep, you know, look at the positive side. Maybe that just, uh, again, a lesson for you and for others, inshallah, that would never go back that way. Wallahu a'ala. Well, that was beautiful, Sheikh. Yeah, a lot of times today, teens especially, they, they get so desensitized to sins they don't realize and they keep committing sin after sin after sin and they just end up in a position where they they don't know what to do anymore. Mashallah, that story was was very, very beautiful. Uh, okay. Inshallah, with that, we are going to end. Uh, if you have a special dua, Shaykh. Allahumma taqabbal minna anna kanta samimu al-alim wa tub alayna anna kanta al-tawab al-rahim. Allahumma gfil lana ma qaddamna wa ma akharna wa ma asrarna wa ma alanna wa ma anta alamu bihi minna. We ask you Allah in this moment that you forgive us our shortcomings. You accept from us our best deeds, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask us to show us that which is right and follow it, and that which mm -hmm. is wrong and stay away from it. We ask you, Allah, to fill our heart with Iman and knowledge and hikmah. We ask you, Allah, to teach us that which is beneficial to us and to benefit from that which we learn, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, the way we gather in this space and this place, that we gather together in Jannah al Firdaus al-A'la, with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We ask Allah to keep us safe in our homes, in our lives, to keep us safe, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and protected. We ask you to rid this world from the disease, from this disease, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask you to send a cure immediately and remove from this world, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Keep us and our loved ones safe from it, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Ya Allah, we ask you to bring us back to our masajid, to, the, to your houses, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask you to give us the opportunity to enjoy being back in the masjid and praying there in the masjid and enjoy the company of our brothers and sisters in the masjid, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask you, Allah, that you remove this punishment from, from above us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to bring us closer to you in the way that is meaningful to you. Ya Allah, we ask you that you forgive us our shortcoming and accept from us our best deeds. Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak wa nabina Muhammadin wa ala ali wa sahbihi wa sallam. All right, Jazakallah, Sheikh, uh, for that beautiful. Barakallah, Fikum, inshallah, ta'ala. See you, inshallah, next time, bin Allah, Azza wa Jal. All right, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.